And so for this week, all I'm really concerned is basically the stuff that you already covered in lecture and we already talked a little bit about last week. When you look at the bottom of page 25, beginning with <coughs> PR interval and ending with QT interval, you can go ahead and cross those out because there is not agreement between your lecture textbook and your lab textbook. And I'm not really concerned that you memorize those intervals. Uh, there is a table on page 31.1, or it's table 31.1 for exercise 31 that lists out the lab manual's definitions, which I like better. Um, but I'm not going to have them on our curriculum. They're just ways to break down the ECG curve into subsections. That's pretty much all it is. Um, you'll get that a little bit later. What I want to focus on today is kind of what we're actually doing with electrocardiograms because people tend to overvalue them. They're, they're really valuable. I'm not meaning to say that they, they're not important. They're really important. They're very easy because you're measuring changes in electrical voltage within the body, which is kind of crazy because we don't think of ourselves as like a battery, but we kind of are in some ways. So <coughs> voltage is just a difference in charge. So like a nine volt battery, the little square ones, what the nine volt is telling you is the difference in charge between the two metal things on the end. If you connect that difference in charge, like with your tongue, can do that? Good. My wife had never done that. <laughs> and I was like, you really have never done that? And so I grabbed it and I was like, put this on your tongue. And it scared her. Because <laughs> 9 volts is enough to like actually startle you a little bit. It also makes you taste a little bit of bitter. Um, you should understand a little bit more why that is. Uh, but anyway, we also have slight differences in voltage in our own body. And the biggest thing in our body that causes changes in voltages is the heart. Now there's changes going on all the time. So when, you, you, when you're moving your body at all, voltage is shifting. But it's shifting in a relatively random way. So I like to use like a stadium analogy. Like you walk into the Moda Center, formerly known as the Rose Garden, um, and you walk in there and like before an event or something and everyone's talking, everybody's doing it, it's all a bunch of noise. Like there's a lot of amplitude there, but it's not coordinated. And so you couldn't like measure it very well. Well, that's kind of like what our body is everywhere except for our heart. And our heart, our heart has so much mass to it that when it changes charge and it does it together, where the pacemakers are commanding the heart to all start at one time and end at one time, then you start to get like the audience all chanting the same thing. And so you start to be able to decipher things from that noise. And so in this case, it's not sound, it's charge. And when something, when something in your body cord has a coordinated contraction, the depolarization is like it's synchronous. It's like a nice music. It's like a nice chant with a big group of people. And you need electrodes that you see on this illustration in order to detect that. <laughs> now, the more electrodes you have, the better you are at detecting precisely where this sound is coming from. But you can actually do this with as little as three electrodes. It's just not quite as you know, high resolution. And what you're going to get are just deflection in, deflections in these waves. And these waves represent changes in charge. And I'm going to repeatedly emphasize changes in charge because I think it really helps you really make sense of what you're seeing here. It is not a charge. What an electrocardiogram is sensing is not a charge. It is a change in charge, or more specifically, a change in voltage, but it doesn't really matter. You can say charge. And so notice that the only time that there is a curve in any of these illustrations is when you see the yellow arrows. Because the yellow arrows are representing the movement of a change in charge through the tissue. So it's a wave. I'm going to refer to it as a wave of depolarization, just like the illustration does. So this all begins with the SA node leading all these autorhythmic cells. So the heart is a, will beat on its own. But the SA node has a high frequency, relatively high frequency depolarization. And it's really, really strong. So when it goes, everyone else goes. And so that's what you're seeing is the wave of depolarization that was initiated by the SA node. Now, because it's a change, the pink, pink stuff was at the, what's called the isoelectric state, or just the normal <coughs> state, a resting membrane potential type thing, right? Just normal. It's baseline. That's what the flat areas of the line mean. But because you have now a change, you actually get a deflection in this wave. And the P wave represents the depolarization of the atria. Now, it is not 
representing the depolarized atria. It is representing the depolarization of the atria. Do you guys get the difference? Once the atria actually depolarize, they could remain depolarized forever, and you would still get a flat line, like right here. These are depolarized, contracted, but the line's flat, because they're not changing in terms of their electricity. And that's the key in interpreting these things, is that this curve is representing changes, not the actual voltage at any given time. That's not what it is, it's just a change. So that P wave was the sweep of depolarization through the atria. Once they fully depolarize, boom, we're back down to our isoelectric state. Then, through the AV bundle and the, well, the AV node, then the AV bundle, then Purkinje fibers, you're actually going to move that depolarization. Again, yellow arrows meaning we're actually having another wave of depolarization through the ventricles. The ventricles are huge. And so when they depolarize, the green one, the green area is like high school stadium. Sorry, the atria is like the high school stadium all chanting together is their depolarization. The ventricles are like the motor center. I mean, you have way more. You have hundreds and hundreds of times more cells in the ventricles. So when they yell, they're much louder. So the yelling in this case, again, is still the change in charge. But because it's such a massive tissue, it causes a huge deflection in the, in the actual uh, electrical current going through the electrodes on your body. That's why you get such a tall spike in this one. So that's your QR, and then as it comes back down, it's the S. That Q should be pushed over a little bit more. It's a little confusing, but as you probably already know, the last part of the QRS complex is the S, and that's representing a ventricular depolarization. Again, that represents that the ventricle is currently depolarizing. It does not represent that depolarized state. Once the ventricle balances out, you will return to that isoelectric state, just like we saw with the atria. Now, the T wave, you probably already memorized as ventricular repolarization. Well, with repolarization, that's also a change in charge. So this thing also detects that. So as you return from the depolarized state in red to the repolarized state in green, during that transition, you're also going to have a huge change in charge, and that's the T wave. So it doesn't matter which direction, whether you're depolarizing or repolarizing, you're still going to get a deflection in this curve because of that. So the atria, atrial repolarization is hidden because when atrial repolarization is <coughs> happening, ventricular depolarization is happening, and therefore you never ever see a signature of atrial repolarization. It's unmeasurable because of its timing. It's like the high school stadium trying to say something when Moda Center is right next door yelling. You're not going to hear the high school stadium. You just won't. And so eventually you're going to get down to total repolarization, which truly is just returning back to normal. And that's why we're firmly in that isoelectric or just the flat area of the line. So a couple questions I get about this a lot is the T wave versus the QRS wave. Why are they not the same height? And the reason for that is that it's the same amount of change in charge, and it's the same amount of tissue, right? Going from pink to red is the same amount of tissue and the same charge change as going from red back to green, returning back to normal. The difference is how quickly it happens. And so with repolarization, it happens in three to four times as much time, and therefore the change in charge is less intense. So the QRS wave is really tall because it's a ton of energy coming out really quickly. Whereas the T wave is really slow compared to the QRS wave. So the total change of charge is the same. It just happens over a longer period of time with the T wave. That's why the T wave is shorter, but it's wider. It's not just shorter in the same width. If it were the same width, it would be the exact same height. Because it's truly the area under these curves that represent how much tissue is being depolarized. Why, so, did, why does the R dip down below the initial? Point? So right. the, the real challenge with this and one of the limitations to EKGs is that they are representing a and movement a and a direction of change in charge. With the atria, that's easy. The direction is basically one direction. So it's not actually straight down. It kind of goes at this angle. <laughs> 
but because all of the charges are in, on average moving in the same direction, you get a nice clean curve. Ventricle goes down and up. And so simultaneously you have depolarization going this way and then it reaches the apex and actually goes almost the opposite direction but not quite. And so the reason you go both directions in the QRS wave compared to any of the other waves is that the ventricle is the only thing that actually has depolarization and repolarization going on in opposite directions. And so if you take a more advanced class in this, in order to be able to look at what the ventricle is doing, you have to put leads in different locations on the body and they will emphasize the trip down the interventricular septum. So if you're afraid of like, ha if you think you might have, ha have had a heart attack in the interventricular septum, you take sort of a different look at the heart to emphasize this direction of movement. Whereas if you're concerned with the walls of the ventricle, you'll, you'll move the electrodes to take a little bit different look at it. And then when you see somebody like in the picture that's just all hooked <coughs> up with electrodes, they're looking at it from every perspective because they're just trying to figure something out. So last thing I want to mention, don't worry about the intervals that you see on the bottom. Just look at the top one. I want to, want to re-emphasize that this is a useful thing because it's so easy to measure, but it does not give you an idea of stroke volume. It doesn't give you blood pressure. It doesn't give you cardiac output. It doesn't give you a lot of other things that you need to know about the cardiovascular system. It's simply giving you the electrical events. And so there is one other thing you can measure from EKGs, though, and that's just heart rate, right? So every time the ventricle contracts, you can actually get an EKG or an ECG heart rate out of it simply by counting how frequently that tall peak goes by. That's it. So that's another thing you can get from these. They're not going to use this if they don't have any reason to. Um, you're not going to slap this on someone to get their pulse. Right? There's other ways you can do that. We'll talk about it in a second. But that is something you can do. Um, and it can be useful in times where you're not actually sure of a patient's pulse because there's conditions where the heart will beat at a different rate than the pulse you sense at the radius or anywhere else throughout the body. And because of that, you might need kind of someone to solve the problem and give you another measurement. This can do that. Um, but again, it's simply the electrical activity. Uh, the other reason they show, they show up a lot is that if you suspect someone, there's blood tests that you can do to see if you've had a heart attack. Basically, the muscle, the molecules inside a cardiac muscle will get leached out into the blood. And so if you have this specific type of troponin in your blood, it can kind of grade the severity of your minor heart attack that you may have, may have had. Um, the other thing you can do is if you have permanently damaged heart muscle, it does one of two things. It either creates a block in the conduction system of the heart. The most common one is called a bundle block, that AV bundle. It can actually get scar tissue on it basically so that when the wave of depolarization tries to get into the ventricle, it doesn't get there as quickly. So you'll get an expansion of the gap between the P wave and the QRS wave. And so that can give you an indication of how much damage has been done to the heart. Um, another thing that can happen during minor heart attacks or major heart attacks is that instead of killing the cell, you just sort of hurt it and it turns into its own pacemaker and it's called an ectopic foci. And that's ectopic meaning out of place like an ectopic pregnancy. Um, that's always what that ectopic term means. So that means that there's another pacemaker that you've created in your heart now because you damaged the heart. And so that's just one of the things that damaged heart cells do is they'll tend to create their own pacemaker. And so if you've got a random chunk of the ventricle that's going to go off too early or something like that, you'll get really interesting QRS waves out of that. And that'll be a sign of precisely where you have damaged the heart. So you'll see these broken out a lot in people that either have heart attacks or have a suspected heart attack because they give you a really good idea. You can actually find the location of damage based on how different that ECG wave looks. All right, so that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about in terms of ECG and EKG. Um, I do want to make sure you guys know these terms, tachycardia, bradycardia, and fibrillation. So tachy is fast, brady is slow, and fibrillation is uncoordinated. And so tacky, like a tachometer on a car, like the RPM gauge, that's how I remember it. Brady, because Tom Brady's slow. <laughs> and you can't, you can't do a deflate gate joke yet, I don't think. No, not quite. 
Um, and then fibrillation again. A fibrillation is, actually happens in any muscle, so fibrillation really just means very small components of the muscle are all doing their own contraction. They're not working together. So this is the noisy stadium is fibrillation, right? Nothing's working together. Um, and fibrillation comes up, well, it seems to be more common in the atrium, but it seems that way because when you have ventricular fibrillation, you die generally. You can't get away with having uncoordinated contractions in your ventricle for very long. Um, defibrillators try to help with that. They try to shock the ventricle and wake it up because the ventricle looks like a bowl of jelly when this is happening. It's just a, a vibrating bowl of jelly. It doesn't look like a still bowl of jelly. Like just all the way, just bouncing around, no coordination whatsoever. If you shock it, you can get it back to a normal rhythm, hopefully. And so that's devastating in the ventricle. The atrium, not as big of a deal because even without your atria contracting, you'll still fill the heart and you'll still pump blood. So you're not going to die from that. All right. So that's 